coming to the last uh, session, which is uh, the statistical framework, and we have a guest from the fractional framework, which, uh, which is Peter. And we have Jerry on the phone, so he will, it's an old technology, maybe not everyone knows that anymore, so the telephone and not internet. <laughs> so um, he will be on the phone and will do his presentation from there. So I think the, the most topic here now is that we, the importance of valid inference. We will hear about that and about blending data. Then we will see a little bit about that access is needed, but there are limitations of current statistical disclosure approaches. And at the end, we will see that there's something outside the US, so we will hear about what's happening in Europe and in the UK. And there are new EU regulations, data without boundaries, a project, and then the administrative data research network, which Peter will alive, do then. Um, I'm not sure if I can give some famous last words, then I will do that now. Um, I think we need big data for solving real and uh, complex problems of society, and we have seen that by the huge city uh, um, examples. We need a circle of trust from the data owners, although we do not know all the time who are owning these kind of data, to individuals and to the researchers. And we definitely need access to these kind of data to fulfill uh, these complex problems. So I'm happy to have three people on the panel. And it's something a little bit about like ex an accident to have them here. Um, to um, which affected my life the last year. So it's really fantastic to have them here. So there's Frauke Kreuter from Maryland. She's also uh, affiliated to two German universities and to the Institute for Employment Research where I'm on. Um, and um, I, we know each other for nearly 20, 20 years. She's a great example to have a not so good teacher and then you, oh, you go through that and you have success afterwards. So she's an expert on survey methodology, especially on sampling and measurement errors. And there's also the APO task force on big data where all other people are in the room. Yeah, I have seen them. So then we have Cherry on the phone. He's from Tube. And Cherry introduced me to a lot of statistical staff the last years uh, um, about, for example, imputation techniques, how to fulfill imputation to have data protection. That's also one of his main issues, like also missing data techniques and analysis of complex data. And as Fraugen, I didn't mention that, all of the three are in contact with administrative data institutions. Um, he is PI of the Triangle Sen uh, Census Research Network. And last but not least, Peter Elias, um, he is professor of the Institute for Employment Research in Warwick. So the English, the UK have the same as the Germans. We have the same name, I realized. And he is also honorary professor at the UCL. Um, and he, he's a little bit of an orientation for me because he pushing this data access um, in the UK, in Europe, and also in the OECD and forward. And so. Um, and he's not only or orientation, he's also frustrating me all the time because he has so much success on that, so <laughs> we will hear about that. Um, the last thing he's now on uh, is the deputy chair of the Administrative Data Research Board of the UK Statistics Authority, just to see. I think that was your last position or something else at the tail. No, 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 that's ah, the good. <laughs> so um, now we start with Frauke and then... Uh, Sherry is coming and Peter's at the end. Thank you very much. I um, have to correct Stefan there a little bit. I think he was an excellent teacher, at least in um, raising everybody's interest in these topics since back when in statistics. I do want to acknowledge my co-author, Roger Peng, who some of you might know from the Simply Statistics blog and um, or as a co-editor for a recently published book um, from Victoria Sutton and um, Fritz Leisch on reproducible research, another good book that I can plug here a little. Um, the, we have been dealing with a lot of issues and I think it's a rather comprehensive um, chapter on extracting information, um, which I will not cover in detail. Um, I simply want to make 
three key points here in what I'm going to say. Um, focusing on the data generating process, uh, focusing on the need for a framework when we think about using big data, and um, pointing to sort of the advantages and disadvantages of these data aggregations that have been mentioned a few times before um, and the data linkage that uh, goes along with it. So when we look at the data generating process, and that's something Daza mentioned earlier too, he said that a lot of the thinking in big data is not all that different from the thinking in small data, and uh, that's certainly something we have gotten pretty good at. Even so, Julia said earlier that um, census people and um, other survey folks might be outdated in the way they think about data. But I think there's something to learn from the way um, we think about data, and that is that we have learned to pay careful attention to the data generating process. Um, some of you might remember from your early uh, statistics days, usually covered in Statistics 101, the famous example from the Literary Digest poll in 1936, where you know they were happy to have 10 million voters in their database and mail to them and ask them uh, for um, the next election outcome and then miserably failed in their predictions. So size itself, while always exciting and you know repeatedly we get into that, uh, is not the whole story. And um, in the Literary Digest poll, the problem was one of selection bias and non-response bias. And in general, with any data source that we look at, the question is, who is generating the data? What is generated there? And why are they generated? So if we take you know, the seven and 750 million Facebook users or the uh, 645 million Twitter users um, that currently exist and probably you know, many more since these data have been published, um, or the one billion tweets that you get in five days, you know, that's a lot. But the question is really, whom do these pieces of information represent when you take them? And um, this question can only be answered with respect to a certain research question you have. So for certain purposes, this might be the perfectly fine database. And uh, maybe all events that happen in the world can be captured that way. As we heard, you can be a victim of a minority that reports about you. So even if you are not part of these groups and data sets, it, there can still be information on you out there. But um, for other research questions, that might not be um, the right set of data for you. So this is this paying attention to the data generating process is something that I think, or we think, uh, you can't just dismiss um, because of the size you have. Um, if we take the examples that uh, I saw some people here from the uh, New York City um, offices, you know, for housing and transportation or um, similar entities, you know, it's, like, it's appealing. It's very exciting to think about um, cell phone uh, accelerometer data to um, measure potholes in the city, but that only works if in all parts of the city people with smartphones drive around. And as long as that is not the case, then of course you have um, holes in your data set. And this already is a shout out to thinking about this linking of data because you know, there's, for certain parts of the city or for certain parts of the population, you might get a lot of data for cheap, but then you need to carefully design the collection on other parts um, in order to not uh, um, have these biases. One important distinction that uh, Bob Gross, he was mentioned earlier in the intro speech, has made in his talk at the World Bank um, a few years ago was this on designed and organic data. And I think a lot of the big data that are designed sort of placed in purpose sensor data that we can collect. We have control over many of these selection and biases processes, whereas with the organic data that we just collect, um, as for example, in this example on, on Twitter and Facebook, this is much less the case, and thus we need to understand that data generating process if we want to extract meaningful information. The uh, survey world has um, used over the last, you know, what is that, 20 years now probably, um, uh, a framework um, under the label total survey era framework. This is one of um, many different uh, depiction of this uh, framework. On the left-hand side of this graph, you see so that the different steps um, that you need in order to um, come from a population to a survey statistic, so getting the representation side correct. And on the right-hand side, you see um, the 
uh, different steps in order to get the measurement side correct. And as you see, survey methodologists for survey data have identified a lot of error sources. They were pointed out beforehand, the coverage error, not having everybody from the population in your sampling frame. But um, also very important these days, non-response error, not everybody having everybody responding to these data. This framework, in our opinion, is a good starting point. It's by no means sufficient and adequate for big data, but it is a good way to start thinking about similar frameworks for the generation of um, big data and um, identifying error sources. As I said, their importance can only be um, looked at in light of a particular research question or a particular research hypothesis. Paul Beamer, who is sitting here in the audience at RTI, he has um, given at APO um, a talk, the um, annual meeting of the American Association for Public Opinion Research, trying to expand that framework for big data and um, other people thinking along those lines, and we can only encourage that activity. And lastly, um, because we will have, you know, probably um, never a situation where we can get the full scope of information through the same source, as it was pointed out repeatedly, and because the linking of data is one way to and that these big data um, are generated in the first place, we will be challenged by the differential privacy requirements, and a lot of that was discussed <laughs> beforehand, and the issue of ownership. I mean, it was, you know, we, we didn't talk too much so far, and I hope we can rectify this in the discussion about, um, you know, all the private companies that own these data and might be enticed to work with us to put them into research data center because they too would like to have more information or linked up to other sources of information so that both researchers and private entities can learn enough um, or more than they could otherwise without um, the combination of these. Stefan mentioned the need for trusted third parties. I'm not sure who those will be, but that um, is gonna be a, uh, a challenge for us to be solved. But on the other hand, I do think that this linking and um, the, you know, the, the, uh, the remote access maybe to these research data center and the work with big data in those data centers will have a nice side effect that is that you always have to write code and submit code somewhere. So, you know, a big problem that small data sets have that people just, you know, type on the fly their analyses and often create um, research results that are not reproducible. That is a little less likely with the technical solutions that we heard before. So um, somewhat better way to ensure um, transparency when we deal with these data. So those are the key points for now, and um, I'll hand it over. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be able to talk with you all about this chapter that I wrote with Alan Carr, my co-author from the National Institute of Statistical Sciences. Um, in our chapter, what we did was suggest lessons that stewards of big data could learn from the experiences of statistical agencies who've been uh, thinking about releasing confidential data for decades. Um, and we also talked about how big data and, and big computing might impact statistical agencies' dissemination practices. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that latter topic. I'll refer you to the chapter, but I do want to mention a few of our points um, on the first topic. So let's go to the next slide about releasing record level data. So I need to admit up front a, a personal bias, which is that I'm a very strong advocate of the release of public use record level data. Um, even in contexts where the analysis is going to be brought to the data, for example, for really large data sets, we're not going to be shipping around these really huge files all over the place. We are more likely to have a centralized server where um, people remote in and, and, and submit code, as Fraka was just saying. But even in that context, I think having public use record level data is incredibly valuable. Even the most seasoned, mature researchers do not know the right questions to ask, generally, before they see data. They don't know what sort of variables need to be aggregated, or what kind of errors there might be in the data, or what kind of transformations might be useful for the data. So having some public use data set, and I'll talk about what I think that should be in a few slides, I think opens the door to much more informed analyses, which I worry that a sort of a, a remote analysis, get the outputs only system 
will really struggle to, to help us get around that problem. Um, the other benefit of having record level data is for student training and, and methods development. Um, students can't learn, the next generation can't, can't learn unless they have realistic data. So I think it's really important that we, that, that data stewards with big data strive to find ways to share record level data. Of course, the challenge is one that we've talked about throughout the book, which is that this can be quite risky for data subjects and the stewards themselves, simply stripping names, addresses, tax IDs, et cetera, uh, typically does not suffice. Uh, this is particularly the case for big data, which often come from administrative sources or from social media. Uh, hence, by definition, those data are available to others and possibly a very large number of others. And so um, there is uh, possib increased possibility and perhaps increased incentive for people to try to make those linkages and identifications. Uh, furthermore, these data sets tend to have a, a large number of variables, which means uh, essentially there's a lot of information available for matching, and everybody really is a population unique. Most statistical agencies, when they release uh, data from small-scale probability samples, they're leaning heavily, rightly or wrongly, on the random selection as a protection and the modest number of variables as a protection. Uh, with big data, I don't think we have either one of those. And there are all sorts of examples out there of um, data sets that have been disseminated with um, sort of the obvious identifiers, names, and et cetera, stripped, but there's enough information out there in, in, in the public that, that leads to identification. A lot of you, I imagine, are familiar with the Netflix challenge. Uh, that was one where uh, Netflix, of course, released um, people's movie preferences and challenged individuals, challenged researchers uh, to uh, come up with the best prediction algorithms. A couple of computer scientists actually matched that data to some online movie ratings databases and were able to identify individuals, even though Netflix had supposedly anonymized the data. Um, another example, which some of you may not be aware of, this is really interesting work coming out of the Tanya Sweeney's lab. Um, so she took some health data, which satisfied all the HIPAA requirements, and for the state of Washington, which she was able to purchase for $50, and essentially looked at diagnosis codes for accidents, uh, and then went into the newspapers and tried to find the corresponding stories for accidents, and was able to identify about 43% of those accidents, uh, getting names for those people, and then therefore learning all sorts of stuff about them. Uh, so so the, the threat is there, um, and I think it, it, it's increased with, with big data compared to these uh, small-scale probability samples. So next slide for my typical disclosure control methods provide an answer. Of course, statistical agencies worry about this all the time, uh, and they have a long history of, of trying to perturb data before releasing them. Any data set you download from a government agency has undergone some sort of perturbation. Uh, things like aggregating data, particularly geographies, you don't get much below 100,000. Um, swapping records and switching fields from one to another, adding noise. Usually these sorts of perturbations are, are sort of low intensity because they have a, a big impact on the quality of the data. Uh, and again, the agency sort of leans on random sampling as a protection method, which I don't think is reasonable to lean on for, for big data. Uh, I, in our, our chapter, um, we, we look at some of the typical methods that are used by statistical agencies, and we come to the conclusion that we don't think that these methods are likely to be effective for protecting big data. Um, low intensity perturbations just aren't going to do anything. So a lot of agencies swap data. You know, they take one record and swap their values with another. We have no idea what the swap rates are. They, they protect those, but we all think they're in the half to 1% sort of range. Well, that kind of protection by perception probably is not going to work with with big data where, again, lots of people have access to, to the records. They're all, uh, and high intensity perturbations are likely to destroy the quality of the data. If you think about adding enough random noise that you could protect Bill Gates's income, that data aren't going to be very useful. Okay. Uh, and so what's a potential path forward? Well, next slide, potential path forward. Um, the, the idea that we suggest 
in in the chapter uh, is to sort of string together three systems which um, are to varying degrees already existing, um, but with that but but not together. So the first part of the system would be sort of a public use data that's highly redacted. Uh, we call it synthetic data. Um, what are synthetic data? This is something I've worked a lot on. Uh, Stefan uh, has, has um, generated synthetic data for some of his, his data products. Uh, the basic idea is to build statistical models that capture the um, global structure in the data and simulate new data from those models and release that simulated data. Then you can't link. There is no record linkage because all the all the um, records are simulated. But hopefully we can preserve a lot of the structure in the original data. Uh, there's not zero risk in those that you can dream up situations um, sort of akin to the very very strong assumptions of differential of, in, of intruder knowledge and differential privacy, uh, where where the synthetic data might be revealed. Uh, but for most real world practical situations, the synthetic data are are quite. Um, they have pretty good protection. So people can access that synthetic data. It might be a sample. It may not be as big as the original data. Um, and learn from that. Uh, <clears throat> figure out what sort of questions could be asked, what could not be asked. Then they may go to uh, apply for access for a remote access uh, situ uh, solution, uh, sort of the virtual machines or, or, or remote data enclaves that are around. Oh. The third part of the system is to couple with something called a verification server. And the idea here is um, someone who analyzes the, the synthetic data really has no idea about the quality of their analysis, however that synthetic data has been created. And it, so they don't know whether to trust it or not. So wouldn't it be nice if we could dream up a system, or make a system, I should say, that has the real data, has the synthetic data, a user submits a query, for, um, for the, to the system. The system does the analysis on both data sets and reports back a measure of fidelity of the two analysis. Uh, and if the user is happy with that answer on the synthetic data, then maybe they don't have to go through all the headache of applying for access to the real data. If they're not, then they apply for access. But they haven't wasted their time because they've learned a lot offline uh, and so they'll be far more efficient when they actually get to the server. And actually that will help the server as well because um, you, you know, you can have a lot of people hitting this server. You want you want them doing as much as possible offline so that you free up cycles for other people. So that's an integrated system that I think is a path forward. The pieces are there. Um, I won't go into detail here, uh, but I just want to point point some um, directions for for people. Um, synthetic data. So there are several synthetic data products, this model-based synthetic data. One that I've been involved with is the Synthetic Longitudinal Business Database. So this is a 30 million record file with, of every establishment in the United States, um, including their payroll and employment history and all sorts of other stuff. You can download that now from the Census Bureau website. It's the first uh, record level, establishment level um, data that's been released by a government agency in the U.S. and I think the world. Um, the survey, survey of income and program participation has got 250,000 people and about 600 variables uh, that have been synthesized. And we're working on taking methods from machine learning and turning them into automated synthesizers to cut down on the time. Uh, the remote access solutions, Peter will probably talk about some of those, but NORC has got a virtual data enclave. Various universities all over the country are creating sort of protected data networks with virtual machines. We have one here at Duke. And then this verification server is the one link that's, that's the weakest. It's not been built yet, uh, but we are developing ideas for quality measures um, that, that uh, the, the, the trick here is when you report back quality, you leak information about the original data. And so you have to be clever. Uh, and this is where some of the differential privacy ideas can come into play in particular. Um, you have to be clever about what kind of information you can give people about the feedback. So uh, next, next slide for the comments. Um, last slide would be comments and questions. Um, and, uh, and thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. So before handing over to Peter, I have to say that the, the same solution Cynthia Twork is, has written in her chapter about a trusted curator, a curator and that there will be no direct contact for the researcher through the real data, which also will affect how researchers will work with the data because at the moment everyone wants to have direct contact to the data, which here uh, 
Jerry has a solution for that, but Cynthia also is mentioning something like that. So, Peter, your turn. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, let me start off by saying it was about a year ago that uh, Julia Lane phoned me up and uh, described to me the concept of this book and all the great people who were going to produce chapters for the book. Now, I've, I've known Julia long enough to know that there is a little word that always crops up. So I beat her to it and I said, so? So she said, so? Um, the reason I'm calling you is that we want you to do a chapter which kind of looks at the European perspective on all of this. <laughs> so <laughs> that was an impossible task. And I had to start by deciding if I was up to it, then uh, how would I carve this into something uh, a little bit more uh, meaningful and doable in the time available and also within the scope of my own uh, knowledge and, and experience. And so I've produced a chapter which is in two parts, effectively. One part looks at the history of what we call the right to privacy in Europe, how it arose, why it arose, when it arose, how it's transformed over the last 50 years, and where we now stand in Europe with this concept of a right to privacy. And although you might not be interested in the history, I think this is a very important part of this chapter because it ends up with the point we're at now, which is a very difficult position for European researchers and for many other researchers who want to collaborate with European researchers in terms of how this is going to evolve over the next few years. The the problem is essentially one about the need to develop a harmonized approach to the, the perception uh, and the, uh, the implementation of a concept of privacy as, as applied to, to, to personal information. And we've reached a point now where what we've had uh, for the last uh, 10 years or more has been called a, a, a data protection directive. And we now have a regulation. And this is a very important distinction. These are the two key uh, legislative instruments that are used within the European framework. The directive is a piece of legislation where every member of the European Union tries their best to implement the directive within their own legislation. So they have to look at a directive, go away, think about it, think about how to create their own legislation that will achieve the ends. How they achieve the ends is not relevant. It's just that the end will be achieved via whatever legislation they introduce. A regulation, on the other hand, is a piece of legislation that supersedes all national legislation. It takes priority over it. It doesn't need to be enacted within the uh, national legislative framework. It overrides it. And so, of course, it's much more powerful as a legal instrument. And that's the route the European Union has gone down over the last four years. They've been developing a regulation, and it has now proceeded through the European Parliament. It only has to be approved by the Council of Ministers for it to be uh, uh, enacted. Um, and, of course, this will happen over a period of about a couple of years or so, two or three years. The problem with this regulation is that it goes back to what we've heard this morning is this rather... Um, ill-fitting uh, concept of consent, informed consent, and it makes it much harder for data sets to be linked together when informed consent has not been obtained. And so for a lot of research in many areas, in health research, in the social sciences, where we are working with data which we really cannot anonymize, we have to protect, but of course they are so detailed it's just impossible to anonymize them, as again has been said today, then uh, the, the legislation says, well, you have to obtain consent. And that brings with it, of course, all sorts of problems about the cost of obtaining consent, uh, the reliability of that consent, how will it be obtained, uh, uh, how durable is it, and so on. So we're in a rather difficult place, and that, I think, is uh, part of this, this chapter, is trying to understand how we've got to that place. And I've uh, speculated a little bit on how we will go forward over the next few years. And it sits at odds with the, the, the desire within Europe to create something called the European Research Area, which pulls in exactly the opposite direction 
where, it, where there's talk about promoting cross-border access to microdata free from legal obstacles. And, and you can see, I mean, it's a, it's maybe the graphic's not quite right, but they just pull in a, exactly the opposite direction from each other. Uh, and the hope is that there's not somebody standing there with a big pair of scissors that's going to cause it all to collapse. So um, that's kind of where we are. This is just a piece of information from a more traditional type of survey about how people at the European level trust different authorities with their personal data. Do they have total trust, the blue? Do they do not trust, the, the red, or th they don't know? Uh, and this is, comes from a, a survey, it's called Eurobarometer. It's a huge survey conducted all across uh, the, the 27 countries of the European Union. Um, and, and these results have been compiled without reference to countries. It is quite interesting to look at it by country. But this is just the overall European picture. Uh, and you can see that on the whole, there's pretty well, pretty good trust in terms of health and medical institutions to handle and deal with our, uh, and protect our personal information. And the, the lowest levels are internet companies, uh, phone companies, shops and department stores. So health and national public authorities sit towards the top of that list. And I think that's quite good news. And I think that's what we are trying to play upon in terms of how we are seeking to develop cross-border access to microdata uh, within the European Union. In so doing, um, we've got to look at the legal situation of those bodies that hold data. This is a real obstacle when you find that some uh, in some countries, there are laws that prevent them sharing data in much uh, as we, we would like to, to, to do. Uh, in, in some countries, different legislation applies to different types of data. Um, so we also face up to this lack of agreed and common standards on data security. We have no uh, uh, agreed ways in which we can authenticate potential research users. Um, we certainly have to have coordinated governance structures, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we're approaching that within the United Kingdom. And the third bullet point there, really should be the last one, because I want to stress this more than anything else, is the need for public support. I showed you the statistics that says that for health and for administrative data held by government departments, there is a degree of support for the fact that those agencies will protect that information. So how can that uh, view itself be protected? How can we ensure that the public trust and confidence in our ability as researchers to use their data for the public good is enacted, is, is, is available? Now, I'm going to give you two examples, go over these very quickly, because we talk about them more in the chapter. Um, in terms of cross border sharing of data from national statistical institutes. One of the best examples is a uh, program of research project uh, that Stefan knows all about. He's been involved with this uh, very significantly. And it's called Data Without Boundaries, a lovely name for the, the, the project. And it's promoting access to microdata held by national statistical institutes. And it does it by putting a bit of money and resources into the issue encouraging transnational access by funding travel and subsistence. Well, that's moving the researchers to the data. Not quite a good solution, but not bad. But as well as that, there's also work to develop networks of remote access to data uh, using uh, thin client technology, uh, encryption devices, etc. And, and of course, there's a lot of effort goes into the training of researchers and, and making researchers aware that there are research funds research possibilities available within this within this program so that's been i think quite a successful approach it's still difficult but it's been quite successful within the united kingdom we have a real multi-agency problem with different legislation different ways different perceptions of uh, data security and so on and we brought all of these agencies together and just sat around the table and just bashed heads together until we came up with a solution we did put a lot of money into it, and that helped enormously. And we've created four administrative data research centers. We, <laughs> we kind of have to do this, uh, everything fourfold in the United Kingdom now. How long it'll be united, I don't really know. 
but we do this for Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and England. Um, we bind these together with what we call an administrative data service, and we bring the government departments in on this and form partnerships with them and with the national statistical authorities in the various countries of the United Kingdom and the major government departments. What are we doing? Working to harmonize legislation, metadata training, developing access procedures, and above all of this, putting in place one strong centralized governing body that promotes this network, promotes the service, promotes access, and most importantly, seeks to carry the public with them. And that's a really important part of this. We haven't really spoken about this at all today, but in my view, it's hugely important that we, we have public support, that there's no reason why the papers uh, should start scaremongering us with stories about what we're trying to do with their data, that people already know and they perceive the benefits. How do we do this? Well, one approach we've been experimenting with in the UK is to do it via promotional videos. Now, this isn't finished. It's not the finished product yet, but I'll show you what we have so far. The UK, it's a busy, complicated piece of place. And running the UK is a complicated business. Government departments and agencies couldn't keep the UK ticking over without collecting different sorts of information. Information about people getting sick and being made better. Information about apprentices getting skilled training when entering the workforce. Information about businesses making profits and paying their taxes. The result is a great pile of data about all of us. Now civil servants have prevented from putting all this information into a massive database. The public certainly aren't allowed to look at it either. But there is one group of people who can use this information to help us understand the UK better, and all they need is access to it. By comparing different parts of information the government collects, academic researchers can spot trends which simply wouldn't be obvious otherwise. Linking data can help researchers find out which policies and ways of doing things work well and which have failed to help. That's where the ESRC's Administrative Data Research Network Service comes in. It exists to let these experts gain carefully supervised access to the relevant bits of this information without intruding on anyone's privacy. Its most important job is making sure the research idea being put forward is a good one. Is it ethical? Is it feasible? Ultimately, is this proposal going to help us understand the UK better? The bar is high because getting the data ready for researchers to look at and then link it involves a lot of work. That's why four administrative data research centres, one each for England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, work hard to make sure the information these researchers are seeing can't be linked back to an individual person. They let the researcher have a look, helping them work out what it all means and all the while the information directly identifying you, me, and your neighbour, things like our names and addresses, is completely removed. Researchers don't mind because they're interested in the big picture, not the specific individuals involved. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it, because the end result can often be a bright idea. The kind of idea that can help improve the way patients are treated, and the way those apprentices are helped to get a job. The kind of idea that cuts through our busy, complicated lives, provides an insight into society's inner workings without intruding on anyone's privacy, and ultimately makes our busy, complicated place just a little better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh. a bit cheesy. <laughs> question that, um, that kind of follows off of the, uh, of the framework that, that you had up there. Um, and my question is really, and I'm sure that this is something that statisticians have thought about a lot and I don't know about, so I'm asking about it. That framework sort of stopped at the place where you have a research result. I felt like we needed an additional part of that framework that would talk about what are the appropriate ways to apply this for 
policy or for decision making about individuals or, and so forth. And so my question is, um, is there something like that already out there in the you know sort of uh, old fashioned statistics world or is, and um, and is that is that something that we should be thinking about in terms of the new big data world? That's a good point. I, I, um, I agree with you. I would say for at least for the US uh, federal statistical system, um, they on purpose stay away from that bridge. They you know, really want to produce the statistic and don't, at least most of them, um, make that next step um, to be perceived independent. And, and so, but I, I do agree. I think that could be quite different in the big data context, in part because you um, rely more on the interaction probably to um, even create the proper statistic. You know, it, it, it it's probably has to be more purpose driven um, and tailored by research question. Um, I, I think it stops too short in a lot of other ways as well. I think um, in the big data context, you would see or would need to think much harder about all the post processing done with the data. You know, like which time points do you take? Do you update? Which frequency of updating? What happens in that whole data curating process? Um, I think that that is, you know, a much smaller piece there. Paul, yeah, I was just going to point to Paul because he um, has been working on this a little bit and probably can. Um, add to your question, yeah. Paul Beamer, uh, RTI International. I just wanted to add to Fraka's um, point that there is a framework. We, we get, um, I think the Europeans are, are probably uh, adopted this framework more than the U.S. has, but it's a it's for a framework for total uh, survey quality, which uh, includes with it, you know, somewhere between maybe five to eight dimensions. We call them dimensions of quality. One of the dimensions is is clarity. And accessibility. So, with regard to clarity, it's basically, um, you know, a, a national statistical office has an obligation when they put out the data to basically explain to users what are the limitations of the data, how do you use it, what are appropriate applications of the data, and so forth. And so, that might be a dimension that sort of gets at your point. Can I just add on that? That one of the things that we've given a lot of consideration to in setting up this network I was describing is the fact that a lot of um, access to administrative data and linkage between them in the past was done because there was a direct policy interest in doing it. And so you've got government departments funding policy-driven research, getting academics to do it, but they were, they were kind of driving it and saying, well, this is what we want you academics to do. We've kind of done a deal here with the data holders to say, we're not, we don't like that. We want to have a more kind of blue skies approach to all of this. Um, and so what we've done is w the, the, the research network itself is open to government researchers as well as university, uh, more academic based researchers. And the idea is that the government researchers will, will use these same facilities and expertise to do their own policy driven research and that kind of, then the, the academic sector can kind of step back a bit and say, we're interested in the, the bigger picture, the longer term. We're interested in seeing how we can develop these statistics in ways that maybe you know, policy doesn't indicate is advantageous at the moment. And I think that's a very useful way in which we've kind of cut through what was essentially originally a very, very policy driven agenda. Yeah, I agree on that, but we have nearly the same in Germany. I love the movie, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, but we go directly to reception. Um, I have a question about one bit of the substance of it. <clears throat> um, most of the substance seemed great. It's hard to make hard, these things simple, and it succeeded. One of the things that was mentioned um, was uh, because the researchers don't care so much about the individual data, and they just look at the, you know, the aggregate data, your privacy is one of the reasons your privacy is protected. Um, and you know, well, that's certainly, of course, true in so many instances here. You know, in, in our lab, sometimes um, it's just ex precisely the personal data that, that drives the, um, the type of computational social science research studies that we do, which are incredibly valuable. Um, is there a, a concept of some role maybe uh, to um, address what would be needed um, to enable those, that type of access to data and the type of protections as well? Or is the thinking maybe that, that, well, that's good science, that would happen in a different network? You're touching very much upon the uh, ethics of research and the fundamental 
reason for research? What do we do with the results? What should we do with the results? And to what extent is that a kind of the big picture, as that video was implying, and we're not really bothered about the individual? But of course, we are ultimately bothered about the individual and how we achieve that balance. I mean, I've seen this in um, uh, medical ethics is a very big issue when you're conducting a big survey where you're, you're scanning uh, thousands of individuals. What do you do when you find abnormalities in this process? You know, how do you have a process of referring somebody on elsewhere so they can get a treatment? And how fair is that on those people who've not been participants in such a study? These are very difficult questions to answer. I have no answers. But all I can say is that one of the, um, the new activities I'll be involved in over the next year or so is to help to build an internationally acceptable framework for the ethical use of what we call new forms of data. And I think most of the data we've been talking about today, they're not the traditional survey census types of data. We just use this generic term, new forms of data. Um, and I think there's lots of ethical issues that we face that we have to do something about. So first Frauke, then Julia. I just want to um, add a question here. I mean, um, I think what you're getting at DASA in part is sort of the prediction for an individual person. So the best, you know, medical use or the, you know, appropriate price that you pay or whatever. I mean, a lot of these uses of big data have to do with personalized prediction, I would say. And, and so, you know, a big worry there that we have just heard this morning, of course, is a, you know, those predictions can be wrong. The algorithm, I mean, the models applied can be wrong. The data, the way they are analyzed, you know, weren't analyzed um, appropriately. And um, Victoria mentioned some of these. So my question to you is, in this uh, new endeavor that you are engaged in there, is there some thinking not just on the ethical use, but also, you know, applying some gold standard, you know, evidence-based research program, data analysis program that people have to show they have done before they would even be allowed to publish these results, for example? Uh, the simple answer is no. Uh, at the moment, our concern is uh, to just to promote better access, better use, uh, creative linkage between data sets and so on. These are all issues that we have got to face in the future, but we're not there yet. I think what's important here is to recognize that the, the promise of big data and I was, is very much the ability to zero in on very different and uncommon populations, right? So, and, and this is, the, as Jerry knows, the, the concern I have with synthetic data because it gets rid of the outliers. I think the promise of big data that we haven't been that we haven't really been able to address so much in statistics is precisely trying to figure out who are the you know the two percent of the population that's driving ninety percent of the healthcare costs. I'm making the number up. What's the half a percent of the population who are the Bill Gateses who are generating massive amounts of wealth? We frankly, I don't think, care a lot about the 76 million businesses that don't have meteoric growth that just kind of chug along. We're interested in those very small numbers of innovative high growth businesses. On the policy side, and I know we worry about the downside risk, but we do want to be able to figure out who are the nutters who are going to come in and shoot up schools, right? And that, so it's, it's that very difficult uh, cost benefit calculus that Aquisti talks about that can't be aggregated but is an enormous part of the promise and the perils of big data. And that's what worried me also about that uh, terrific video. Uh -huh. this, is, this is Jerry. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Jerry. Had to, had to have an ad hominem and slap at the synthetic data. Oh, no, that's fine. I, I mean, I completely agree. There's not a single disclosure protection method out there that is going to allow you to see that uniquely unique individual. I mean, they're all designed to try to make it very difficult to identify individuals, right? And so I think you have to go to the real data for those sorts of questions. Uh, I think that's the only solution. Yep. But I do think that, that synthetic data can help you understand 
what the unusual person might look like. That's what I also understand in Cherry's chapter. You need the imputed data that you have this direct contact to the data and the research have this direct contact and can establish their program. But then at the end you have to run your totally maybe 99% program on the, on, the, on the real data set. I thought that this is the approach what we have in that chapter. And there's a lot of, I think, background discussion about ethics in some of the chapters in the book. So um, I also like that. Thank you very much.